This season of the forum, we are engaged in a re-examination of the Civil War. Our first two lectures looked at the period leading up to the war and examined some of the causes and uh, the question of the inevitability of the war. Today we will fo focus on the war itself, but as it was experienced by women. In the years between the Revolution and the Civil War, middle class Americans adopted a new feminine ideal, today referred to as the cult of domesticity or true womanhood. Yeah, I think you know what's coming. <laughs> Their thinking went that women, who are naturally more virtuous than men, should avoid the immoral public realm for a life spent as the moral anchor of the home. As wives and mothers, women would soften their husband's innate immorality, raise virtuous children, and indirectly strengthen American democracy. Well, war has a way of interfering with such conventional notions. During the Civil War, thousands of women either became sudden heads of household or went to work in the new wartime economy as laundresses, cooks, or nurses. Some traveled with regiments, and those women were sometimes in the position of blurring the line between soldiers and noncombatants. Other women led spy networks that provided vital intelligence to the military. And an estimated 650 women adopted new identities as men, enlisting in both armies, and fighting and dying on now storied battlefields. These women broke with convention, and in doing so, they defied preconceived notions of women and war. Our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Leonard, is the John J. and Cornelia V. Gibson Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History at Colby College, which is in Maine, which means she is one of the few forum speakers who is relatively undaunted by our weather. <laughs> I know we like to, you know, we like, to, we like to impress people with our weather, but Mainers are, I think, unimpressed. Sorry. <laughs> she is the author of one of the definitive books on this very topic, All the Daring of the Soldier Women in, of the Civil War Armies. Her newest book is Lincoln's Forgotten Ally, Judge J Advocate General Joseph Holt of Kentucky. Leonard serves on the advisory councils for the Lincoln Prize in Civil War History and the Lincoln and Soldiers Institute of Gettysburg College. She is also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Please welcome her. Well, there's a lot of you out there. It's great. Thank you so much for coming today. And thank you, Danielle, for inviting me to this really beautiful facility. Uh, we may have weather kind of like yours, but we don't have a historical society like yours, and I must get back to Augusta immediately and uh, rattle some sabers and get people moving. Uh, on, on, it's just a lovely place. I'm, I'm very uh, excited also, I have to say, as I saw people walking in to see that it's not just, uh, it's not an audience of only women. When I, I teach a lot of American women's history courses at uh, Colby, I think I'm using this mic, so I'm going to put this one down. Um, I teach a lot of American women's history courses at Colby, and I routinely have about 90% women students and maybe at most 10% male students. So I congratulate uh, the men in the audience for understanding that women's history is men's history too and vice versa. Uh, Danielle's already given me a very nice introduction so I won't say uh, anything much more except to say that I also, my very first book, which is uh, Yankee Women Gender Battles in the Civil War, I, I unfortunately is not here today, but I think it, it is uh, the, the place where I started my research. And I, it still can be gotten some places. I'm not sure how you would get it, maybe through Amazon. I don't know if they're doing it print on demand or, or whatever. But it is the place where I started my research. After that, I wrote the book that Daniel mentioned, All the Daring of the Soldier. And, and then I've done a number of different things since then, but I still teach a lot about uh, women's involvement in the Civil War and still consider it a very important aspect of uh, our Civil War history. Today I'm going to talk about women's involvement in the war and also, as time permits, I'll say a little bit about the impact of the war on women in America. This is a topic, it may not surprise you much to know, that until the 1990s, really, didn't draw very much attention, either from Civil War historians or from historians of American women. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. I, just in a simple way, I'd say that I think that 
We have, as a culture, tended to think of war as something that men do. Uh, and Civil War historians, uh, in the 20th century at least, didn't really go out looking for women in the story because they thought it was men's business. And women's historians figured that uh, women hadn't been involved in war either, so they didn't go looking for them either. But starting in about the 1990s, research was, uh, began being done by various scholars, and since then a lot of work has been done in this field, and if you want to get a good glimpse of some interesting works on women's involvement in the Civil War, you can look in the back of this very nice um, brochure that you've been handed out, and, and there's a list of books that you can start with if you want to educate yourself more on this field. The fact that people didn't really study women in the Civil War seems kind of absurd to us now, given that we know how widely the war ranged, how vast its geographical scope was, and how many people were involved in it, either as soldiers or as civilians who had to deal with the war as it came into their neighborhoods. Uh, of course, it is mostly men who became soldiers and who took up arms and died in the war. It's primarily men, of course, who made the major political decisions about how the war would go. But it's absurd, really, to assume that a war on this scale and this scope and a war of this duration could, did not affect women's lives, didn't depend on their support and their encouragement and their participation, both actively uh, on the front and also at home. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which women were involved. Of course, even women who didn't go off to the front in any obvious way, who didn't take up activities that could be directly interpreted as contributing to the military effort of the war, even for those women, the war had a serious impact. At the same time, the development of their and, and, and encouragement of their war enthusiasm was very important for allowing the war to continue. If you lose the enthusiasm of the home front, the war is a lot harder to prosecute. And keeping women engaged in the war effort was very important. Women's lives were transformed by this war, even if they didn't go off to the front, simply by virtue of the fact that their male friends and relatives, husbands, sons, fathers, brothers, joined the military and left for war often enough never to return, or if they did return, in, in a disabled way. They came back missing limbs, missing one limb, missing two, psychologically very damaged by the war in many cases, and so on. So women who simply, who never even left their homes found that the war transformed their lives. Their lives were changed in many cases irrevocably. They also found by simply remaining on the home front that suddenly they were thrust into the position of having to take on often daunting and unfamiliar tasks. Men's departure for the front required women, sometimes single-handedly, to take over to take over in their households, to, to hold their households together, to hold their families together, to hold their family businesses together, to hold their farms and plantations together. In many cases, women were required under these new circumstances to take on and implement new skills to cope with the challenges that men's absence presented to them. In the South, Women who were parts of slaveholding households had to learn, white women had to learn how to tend to their slaves on their own and keep their slaves in line. Women in the North sometimes had to take over businesses and learn to be bookkeepers or managers of their families' uh, activities. This was something that many women had little experience for, at least the things that had traditionally been assigned to men as their household tasks, and it was a very uh, difficult experience. Women struggled over the course of the war to fill these roles that were left open to them by men who had gone to the front. And it's interesting uh, to study the evolution of their attitudes about this work as, by reading their letters as the war progressed. One of the things that I found interesting in my own research of women who simply stayed on the home front was how much early in the war 
they felt very anxious about the burdens that they were now being asked to carry in their households and on their farms and on their plantations and in their businesses. But as the war progressed, women developed a great degree of confidence, and men necessarily developed confidence in them, in their abilities to take on these tasks and to be successful uh, with these tasks. Ironically, then when the war was over and men came back, this often led to tensions, unanticipated tensions between men and women. Sometimes, of course, there was simply relief uh, at men coming home, but often there were new tensions and new stresses associated with renegotiating what it meant to have men at home, sometimes producing friction over how things should be done uh, in, in terms of tasks that had previously been assigned uh, to men. So all I'm trying to get at here is that even if women never left the home front, uh, their lives were transformed by this war. And it's important to remember that as they were on the home front tending to things there, they were also constantly expected to contribute to the war effort on both sides, both in the North and the South, by being faithful cheerleaders of the war, by expressing their enthusiasm relentlessly, by encouraging their men folk to enlist, and encouraging them to stay at the front when sometimes men felt that their duties were divided between their national or sectional responsibilities and their responsibilities at home. Of course, women on the home front did more, uh, women in the war did more than just endure the war or manage the home front in men's uh, absence. At the start of the war, as I'm sure you know, both sides believed that the war would be short. Uh, and both sides confronted the beginning of this war with very small armies in place. In fact, the United States Army, at the time that the Civil War broke out, only numbered about 16,000 soldiers, most of whom were deployed on the frontier fighting against the Indians. Uh, when the war began, of course, these armies expanded dramatically, and by the end of the war, some three or three and a half million men served in the uh, armies of the North and the South. The rapid expansion of these armies and the fact that they were not standing armies of sizable proportion at the time that the war began mean, meant that somebody had to step in to help outfit them and prepare them for war as the governments themselves were getting uh, prepared to do this work. And it was women who largely stepped into this work at the beginning of the war, providing soldiers with their various material needs in order to uh, engage in this conflict. So women were sewing their husbands' uniforms, providing them with food, providing them with medicines and stationery and stamps and Bibles and blankets and bed ticks and all kinds of material goods to enable them to fight this war. And they did so very gladly. As in the Revolutionary War, uh, the cause, whichever side you were on, was a cause that women were eager to contribute to in any way they could. They wanted to contribute to the success of their troops. In the beginning of the war, they saw their uh, troops as being very locally uh, related to them. As the war progressed, they learned to think of the entire army of their region as being their boys. But in any case, they were very eager to contribute. So all across the North and the South, in response to calls for material support for the war, at the very beginning and then throughout the war, women took their local societies, their church groups, their benevolent societies, their sewing groups, and transformed these into organizations that were devoted to providing for the material needs of soldiers, especially when the government seemed unable at times to provide those things. One very early history of the war, written in just immediately after the war was over, described this phenomenon in this charming way. Men did not take to the musket more commonly than women took to the needle. I like this image because it's an image of men going off and doing what they need to do while women are staying at home and doing what they need to do. And it makes it appear 
of course, as if everybody was in complete harmony and knew exactly what their jobs were and linked arms in, in union and, and did whatever they needed to do. Uh, that is not exactly how things happened. There often were conflicts, and I'll talk about one uh, in a second. Uh, but certainly there was a tremendous outpouring of energy by women on behalf of the material and also the spiritual support of the soldiers through uh, their local organizations and then later through uh, organizations of much larger scope, particularly in the North. In fact, it's impossible to accurately calculate how many women or how many such ladies' aid or soldiers' aid or sanitary aid societies came into existence over the course of the war. Tens of thousands of women must have been involved in this kind of work. Probably millions of women would be more accurate. These were what one uh, historian in the 1960s called the bonnet brigades of the war, women who gathered together on a regular basis to scrape lint, to sew uniforms, uh, and other clothing to prepare bandages, to prepare food, and so on. These women, in fact, formed the backbone of the Civil War armies, uh, and the great proliferation of their societies was very important in order for the war to continue. In fact, in New York, and, and I will say that in the North, this kind of activity had much more bureaucratic structural organization than it did in the South, understandably, since the South was in so many ways uh, doing everything by on the fly and by the seat of its pants, uh, and so on. In New York, there were much more structure, or in, in the North, there were much uh, greater structures in place, and even as early as April 1861, the same month that the war began, a group of middle-class women in the city gathered together to form the first major organization of ladies' aid or soldiers' relief. This was called the Women's Central Relief Association. And it, it was formed because these middle class women in New York foresaw that the war was going to last a long time, unlike many of their political friends. Uh, they imagined that it would last a long time. They could see that women had a place in the war, uh, and they formed this Women's Central Relief Association right away. Then by June of 1861, just a couple of months later, again in the, New in the North, the United States Sanitary Commission was formed by uh, uh, activists, mostly male activists, who determined to do what they could to organize this outpouring of soldier uh, material support by women across the North. The United States Sanitary Commission became a government-sanctioned auxiliary of the federal government, and its job was to serve as an umbrella organization for the kind of aid that women were trying to generate for the soldiers. And that leads me to this uh, interesting story I uh, did research on a number of years ago involving a local organization in Keokuk, Iowa, the Ladies, uh, the so Ladies Soldiers Aid Association of Keokuk, Iowa, which was run by a woman named Annie Wittenmeyer, who later, after the war, became the first president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But Annie Wittenmeyer, in the context of the Civil War, was a leading figure in this local organization in uh, southeastern Iowa that immediately leaped into the fray and began doing what it could to serve Keokuk soldiers and get them ready for the war. And a couple of months later, when the United States Sanitary Commission came along and said, well, he, we're here to help you organize the work that you're doing and tell you how to do it and tell you what to do with the supplies that you're producing and where to send them. And by the way, they're not just going to your soldiers, they're going to the soldiers of the National Army. Uh, the ladies in Keokuk, led by Annie Whitmire, said, I'm sorry. I don't think so. Uh, we know exactly what we're doing, and we really don't need your help, uh, and thanks very much. And this led to a kind of struggle for a while between the national organization, which was led by men, 
and the local organization led by these women who wrote uh, rather scathing editorials in local papers saying, you know, if the men want to tell us what to do, they should roll up their sleeves and start sewing uniforms, you know, and making food and stop telling us how to do the thing that we've been doing all along that we know how to do that's part and parcel of the work that we do in our homes and communities anyway. Ultimately, this conflict was resolved, and, but it was a conflict that at least for a period of time was um, seen across, uh, certainly across the North, uh, between these local organizations that were struggling to understand the dictates of this new national organization and struggling to refocus their energy from their local orientation to uh, a national orientation. In most cases, these local organizations came to heel, so to speak, uh, if only because they understood that working with the United States Sanitary Commission allowed their labor to be more beneficial to the soldiers and also allowed women to have access to um, uh, the, the state and to feel that they were really serving a national purpose and it elevated what they were doing. But it wasn't always as easy as that early phrase about men grabbing their muskets and women grabbing their needles uh, and everybody happily supporting the war. So women's involvement uh, in ladies' aid or material aid for the soldiers is, of course, a very important uh, area of contribution for women during the Civil War. Perhaps the other major category of women's Civil War service is uh, in their capacity as nurses. And again, <coughs> nurses or hospital uh, workers of various sorts. Again, it is absolutely impossible for us to ever know how many women engaged in this kind of work during the war, especially if we try to include women in the South and women in the North, women in the East and women in the West. It's impossible to know because although there were some formal structures uh, and formal bureaucratic ways that women got involved in nursing and hospital service, there were many more informal ways that women got uh, involved in the war in this capacity. And, and as I tell my students, all you have to think about is how often the war came right into people's communities. Uh, and when the battles were taking place in people's communities, and then the battles came to an end and the armies went away, who do you suppose was there to tend to those sick and wounded soldiers who remained, and also, frankly, to bury the dead? Uh, after the battles were over. So there are many women's uh, uh, medical and nursing uh, contributions that we can never, ever calculate. Uh, but the records that we have for official ways that women got into hospital and nursing service are, again, uh, very impressive and show us that at least, at the very least, tens of thousands of women were serving in this capacity in the North and in the South. Uh, tens of thousands, I would say, uh, is, is just a very low estimate. Many women got into nursing and medical service by traveling with their regiments, by simply being attached to regiments, going with their husbands or brothers or sons, uh, with their regiments as uh, nursing, uh, in a nursing capacity for those regiments. Uh, in the north, they're also very quickly uh, developed a, an, a government a, a, a entity associated with the government that would channel women into nursing service. And this, is, uh, this was led by the very famous Massachusetts reformer Dorothea Dix, whom many people know from her work in prison and asylum reform prior to the Civil War. But during the Civil War, she, through her own efforts, contributions, sacrifices, and, and pressure on the federal government, uh, became the Union Army's superintendent of women nurses. And in this capacity, uh, starting in June of 1861, she became one of the key ways that women who were interested in serving in uh, medical capacity during the war, for the Union Army, of course, were able to uh, engage in that work. Dorothea Dix is a very interesting figure. She um, had been in Massachusetts when the Massachusetts, the 6th Massachusetts was attacked 
uh, in the middle of April 1861, and from that moment, she later said she knew that the war was going to be bloody and long, and the casualties would be great, and every man would be needed for the battlefield, and women, quite obviously, she believed, should be allowed to take, take over the work, as they did in their own homes and did in their own communities, of tending to the men's med medical needs. But women found uh, Dorothea Dix and the women that she hired soon found that they were not just um, having to impress the government with the importance of their service, but they were also finding it difficult to impress the uh, medical establishment, the military medical establishment, with the importance of their work. And early in the war, there is a considerable amount of resistance by male medical personnel to women serving as nurses. Uh, they feel like, for one thing, this is Victorian America, as Danielle said, women who, uh, particularly middle class women, who are supposed to be true women, which means therefore they are weak and frail and need to be lying back on their couches and uh, knitting and tatting lace and, and basically ordering you know, their servants around to do any heavy labor. This is, this is something, this kind of work is work that women are not gonna be, these women will not be able to do. Uh, uh, the women, in contrast, prove themselves very effectively as being good nurses, good hospital workers, and ultimately a lot of that resistance falls away. But Dorothea Dix knew from the start that it was going to be what she was proposing, this contingent of women nurses to serve uh, during the war, this was going to be controversial, and as a result, she planned early on to put structures and uh, ideals for the nursing service in place that would help soften the blow uh, to the public of this whole concept. I like to um, read from her standards, her basic uh, circulated statements about what the requirements were for being appointed as a nurse under Dorothea Dix. And what I'm going to read to you is actually a composite of two different statements that she issued. This is what she was looking for, and, and I, I hope you'll note that what she was looking for, there's no evidence that a woman had to have any medical training whatsoever to serve. That was not her concern. Uh, she had other concerns. She said, no candidate for service in the Women's Department for Nursing in the military hospitals of the United States will be received below the age of 35, nor above 50. No young ladies should be sent at all. So age was important. Only women of strong health women who are not subject to chronic diseases, nor liable to sudden illnesses, need apply. Women who will associate themselves by two. Women had to come in pairs, how interesting, to be ready for duty at any hour of day or night. Women who are sober, earnest, self-sacrificing, and self-sustained, who can bear the presence of suffering and exercise of self-control, of speech and manner. No mouthy women allowed. Women who can be calm, gentle, quiet, active, and steadfast in duty. She went on to say, matronly women of experience, good conduct, superior education, and serious disposition will always have preference. Habits of neatness, order, sobriety, and industry are prerequisites. We're still waiting for the medical training. Uh, all applicants must present certificates of qualification and good character from at least two persons of trust, testify, testifying to their morality, seriousness, and integrity. Amounts of luggage limited within small compass, dress plain, brown, gray, or black, and without ornaments of any sort. I find this fascinating, as I said, because there's no requirement for any medical training. The emphasis is on moral integrity and so soberness uh, and, a, and an ability to deal with um, both um, an ability to restrain your tongue uh, and to deal with difficult circumstances. Dorothea Dix clearly was um, trying to con prepare for hostile public opinion at home, and she was wise to do so. Uh, and it, it really did take a while for women to be accepted by male medical personnel, in part because when they did get down to the front, so many women nurses 
actually proved to be quite mouthy. Uh, <laughs> and felt that these male medical personnel were looking at their sick and wounded soldiers as case studies and not the way women caring for the men in their lives, especially their sons and husbands, would look at them and not feeding them the foods that they would feed them and so on. And, and to bring Annie Wittenmeyer back into the picture, one of the most important things she did during the war after she first became involved in ladies' aid uh, was to initiate a whole special diet kitchens program for the Union Army and she and women that she hired established kitchens in military hospitals all across the North to provide soldiers with the food that women thought sick soldiers should be eating that would really bring them back to health. And there's her, her uh, cookbook uh, for those hospitals. Actually, still you can find it in some, uh, some libraries. So women were very heavily involved uh, in nursing and hospital work. Uh, and I will say just uh, as one added note on this nursing business, it is not just middle class women who were involved in this work, middle class white women. As the war progressed, more and more contraband slaves, former slave women, women who had escaped from slavery and managed to get themselves behind Union lines, were deployed into the Union Army's hospitals. Uh, certainly, they were also employed, or, well, I, employed, I say that. Uh, that's the wrong term for how they were used in the South. They were certainly deployed in Southern hospitals as well. Uh, and ironically, in the 1890s, when the federal government finally decided to uh, allow women who had served in hospitals during the Civil War to collect pensions, for their work. They limited the uh, women eligible for pensions to those who could demonstrate that they had been granted the title of nurse or matron. And these women were exclusively white middle class women. So ironically, all of the African American women, all of the uh, working class Irish immigrant women who had served in the hospitals as well were unable to uh, gain pensions after the Civil War uh, back in the 1890s. The other uh, footnote I'll add to uh, this discussion of women nurses is that one of the reasons why prior, uh, when Dorothea Dix was recruiting her nurses for the war, one of the reasons why she didn't ask for medical training uh, in the women that she was recruiting is because there was no formal medical training for women in America as nurses prior to the Civil War. The first nurse training programs, formal nurse training programs we have in this country come in the 1870s. And I think it's greatly to the credit of women nurses and hospital workers during the Civil War that those training programs are developed uh, less than a decade after Appomattox. Let me move to another category of women's uh, Civil War work and engagement, which is as spies and resistance activists during the war. Many of us, of course, are familiar with the name Mata Hari, uh, but we don't necessarily associate women spies with wars uh, of an earlier time. And yet it is definitely the case that women were very actively involved in espionage activity and also as resistance activists during this war. Um, and in a number of instances, they contributed significantly to how battles developed. One of the most uh, famous Civil War spies was a woman named Belle Boyd from Martinsburg, Virginia, now West Virginia. She was a young woman, probably about 17 when the war broke out, and she had extraordinary charm, uh, if not beauty, uh, but she began her service, at least legend has it, she began her service in July of 1861, when a Union soldier, when the Ar Union Army was occupying Martinsburg, a Union soldier tried to hoist a Union flag above her house, and she shot him dead uh, and committed herself to the Confederate cause. She subsequently became a messenger and is often given credit for helping um, Stonewall Jackson during his Shenandoah Valley campaign 
in the spring of 1862. Belle Boyd was arrested and imprisoned more than once for her activities, and in fact, her downfall, or the, the reason why she had to become less and less active, is because she became more and more famous. And as people knew who she was and saw drawings uh, and images of her face, it became much more difficult for her to do the work that she had tried to do on behalf of the Confederacy. Her career came to an end uh, when she became, uh, uh, tried to become a um, blockade runner in 1864, and, she, and the ship that she was on was captured by a Union ship, and uh, that was the end of her career. But during the war, as I said, she was arrested and imprisoned more than once and came to be quite famous for her efforts on behalf of the Confederacy. Another very famous Confederate spy was Rose O'Neill Greenhough. She was a Maryland socialite who then moved to Washington, and she was in her early 40s, supposedly very charming, uh, very famous for inviting members of Congress to her home for various kinds of dinners and soirees and so on. Before the war, she seemed to be connected with just about everybody of importance in Washington. And perhaps, and probably, I suppose, because she was a woman, uh, even after the war, uh, even after secession was underway, and then once the war had uh, begun in earnest, people on both sides still came to her home and spoke, men on both sides still came to her home for dinners and soirees and spoke openly about what was going to happen in the war and what their various plans were. And Rose Greenhow Dooley, a very loyal Confederate, uh, Dooley funneled every bit of information she had to the uh, military high command that, was, uh, that she had access to and more than one Historian has given her credit, in fact, for the Confederate set success at the first Battle of Bull Run in July of 1861. Early on, people wondered uh, how it was that the Confederates could have been so very successful and seemed to know uh, what the Union Army's plans were, and documents later came to light that Rose O'Neill Greenhough had been spreading information that she heard through a series, a, a network that she had created out of her house in Washington. And she had a very elaborate signal code for her, uh, the people that she was working with and so on. Rose Greenhough also was arrested. She was put in prison and then she was banished. She eventually went to England uh, and then she was coming back to the Confederacy in September of 1864 to re-engage in the work, uh, in work on behalf of the Confederate South, but her ship ran aground, and uh, she drowned, supposedly, with carrying very a great deal of uh, coinage in her pockets, uh, she, which she was reluctant to surrender, and it took her down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so, oh well, um, better empty your pockets. Leave your purse when they tell you to get off the ship. Uh, another important woman spy on the Union side is Elizabeth Van Loo of Richmond. Uh, she was a, a Richmond native, but she was a unionist, uh, a very dedicated unionist, and Ulysses Grant <clears throat> later described her as the linchpin of unionist underground resistance in Richmond and gave her credit for helping him in his siege of Petersburg and then also in his ability to capture Richmond in the spring of 1865. Uh, she gathered information through various channels and also ran a, uh, an elaborate spy network of both whites and blacks and uh, funneled as much information as she could to Ulysses Grant at City Point. One of her, her supposedly one of the ways she operated was to wander around the city babbling to herself and wearing strange clothes and uh, pretending that she was a crazy person. Uh, she got the nickname Crazy Bet. Uh, and she supposedly, by doing this, lured people into, or just stood around babbling to herself and listening to what people had to say about what their plans were in uh, Richmond, and then duly went back and funneled that information to people who could carry it out uh, to Grant. After the war, 
Elizabeth Van Lu was treated with tremendous hostility by her neighbors and died in poverty once they realized what uh, she had been up to and the way they knew what she had been up to is that when Grant occupied Richmond, when the Union forces occupied Richmond, one of the first places they went was to Elizabeth Van Lu's house to raise the Union flag uh, over her house and to give her per her protection. Uh, but by giving her protection, of course, they also uh, exposed her as an ally of the Union, and this led to a lifelong uh, humiliation for her, uh, of course, not surprisingly, among her neighbors. The only other uh, spy I'll mention, and there were so many, is Harriet Tubman. Uh, certainly, we think of her often mostly as the great conductor on the Underground Railroad who made so many trips back into the South after her own escape to bring slaves out to safety. What we often don't realize is that Harriet Tubman wasn't a spy employed by the Union Army during the Civil War, a spy and a scout, and was repeatedly, again, sent into the South to move around in the regions that she knew well, to gather information, from slaves uh, and bring that back to the Union Army. And in one case, she is given great credit for having enabled the Union Army to liberate about 800 slaves uh, in one particular expedition by directing them where to go and, and allowing these slaves to climb on board US, uh, US ships and, and be transported into the North, as well as just gathering information. Um, there, these are just some of the best known women who were engaged in spying and, as I said, in Van Lu's case, uh, um, resistance work it, during the Civil War. But there are records in the National Archives of hundreds and hundreds of women who were engaged in this kind of work, particularly in the parts of the country that were involved in a lot of guerrilla warfare, so in the border states, both armies were actually employing women, often for you know two dollars a day, to do this kind of espionage work and report back. So we have uh, account books that list the names of women who were involved in this work and how much they were paid and how many days service they were paid for, uh, and so on. Um, there, and there's even one woman, a record in, that I've seen at least, of one woman named Emma Porch, who, like our Civil War nurses, received a lifetime pension for her service as a Union Army detective during the war. Uh, Harriet Tubman should have received a similar pension for her service, but she, uh, she never did. And she lived, um, uh, she was able to support herself only thanks to the help of, of her neighbors and her community and, and also selling her memoir. The federal government didn't recognize her in the same way it recognized some other women, even though she had been so essential to the government's service. The last category of women I want, well, I'll talk about uh, army women in general. There were, as um, Danielle pointed out, there were women who traveled with the military in their capacity known to be women uh, and serving in a variety of ways with the armies as women doing support work for the service. And this was true, again, both in the North and the South, women who traveled with the regiments as nurses, as cooks, as laundresses, as sutlers. Uh, and of course, there were in both uh, the North and the South women who followed the armies and provided sexual services for, uh, for the soldiers in exchange for rations or pay. When we use the term camp followers uh, or army women, this is often the image that first comes to mind, those women who uh, were providing prostitution services for the soldiers. Uh, I think it's really important for us to broaden our, our vision on this and realize that women were providing a lot of services, uh, as I said, cooking, laundering, nursing, uh, provisioning, uh, and so on. Women did a lot of things as women in relation with the armies. But as um, Danielle said, it's also true that several hundred and perhaps as many as a thousand women were engaged in battle as soldiers during this war. And this is perhaps 
uh, the most interesting group of women of all, although perhaps the least militarily significant uh, to the war, if we assume that three or three and a half million men served in the armies of the North and the South, and a thousand women served, even as many as a thousand women served, certainly they weren't uh, the people who turned the battle one way or the other. Uh, and of course, in order to remain in disguise, most <clears throat> women soldiers, all women soldiers, I would say, tried not to do anything very spectacular, right? Tried not to rise through the ranks. The chances of being noticed as a woman were much greater if you exposed yourself in any way. So by far, uh, the majority, if not all of these women, remained undercover and as little noticed as possible. Uh, but again, at least, at least 500, maybe as many as 1,000 women served in this capacity, cutting off their hair, uh, changing their names, binding their breasts, dressing in men's uniforms, uh, and, and enlisting in the armies of the North and the South. Many of them, we will never know who they are because, as I said, they didn't want to be known. They stayed undercover, uh, and many of them probably died on the field, and we'll, we'll just never know. But some women's stories have come to light, uh, and I'll mention three of the most interesting and most famous of them. Probably the best known woman soldier during the Civil War is a woman named Sarah Emma Edmonds. She was originally from New Brunswick, Canada, and she served in the 2nd Michigan Infantry from May of 1861 to April of 1863. She served under the alias Franklin Thompson, and uh, she stayed in, as I said, for about two years. Eventually, she deserted, uh, and the reasons for her desertion are not entirely clear. Uh, it does appear that she had gotten sick, and certainly one of the easiest ways for a woman soldier to be detected, although it wasn't foolproof, as you'll see in a minute, one of the easiest ways for a woman to be detected was for her to get sick. You'd think she'd be detected when she enlisted. <laughs> because there were supposedly these uh, medical examinations that took place, but clearly they weren't very thorough. Um, <laughs> Have you got teeth on one side of your mouth? You know, have you got a thumb uh, and an index finger? That's, can you tear the cartridge open? That's really all we need to know. Uh, so, but if a woman went to the hospital, she might well be discovered and examination might be more thorough. There's some indication that Sarah Edmonds got sick and feared that she was going to be hospitalized and detected. I think that probably the reason that she deserted is because she um, fell in love with a man in her regiment, a man named Jerome John Robbins, whose diary, um, fascinating diary, is available in a, um, at the Bentley, Muse Bentley Library at the University of Michigan. Jerome John Robbins was a, a, medical, a member of the medical staff of the, the Second Michigan, and he met Franklin Thompson, and they became very close friends. And he initially didn't realize that Franklin Thompson was actually Sarah Edmonds. And his diary is full of his joyful uh, comments about meeting this wonderful young man with whom he had so very much in common. But apparently, at one point, Edmonds decided to confess her identity to Robbins, and the page, he wrote about it in his diary, and then sealed the pages of his diary together where he had written about her identity. Uh, and wrote, uh, this is such a, a come on to historians, wrote around the edges of those pages, do not peek, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look inside here. Uh, so, of course, somewhere, you know, historians tore those pages open, and we can see in those pages his revelation that she had come to him and, and uh, expressed herself to him. Um, 
I, I'm somewhat saddened to say that Robbins writes in his diary, you know, my first response was to tell her about my fiance, Anna, back home. Uh, and I thought, poor Sarah, you know, really, could he have maybe waited a day and, and, and you know, but he apparently told her right away that there was somebody else. And it's not long after that confession that she disappeared from the army. The reason we know so much about Sarah Edmonds is because she did write a wonderful memoir called Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. Uh, it's wonderful, it's weird, too, because she doesn't, actually con she doesn't actually talk about herself going undercover as a male soldier. She talks about a lot of things she did, but she doesn't say, and then I bowed my breast, cut my hair, took on this. So it's, it's a kind of curious memoir that she wrote and published during the war to try to raise money for sick and wounded Union soldiers. So we have that account, but even more important in terms of making sure that of the historical accuracy of her story is that uh, she uh, later in her life applied for a pension from the federal government for her service as a Union soldier. And her pension record is very rich with her explanations about what she had done during the service and affidavits from a variety of people who worked with her and so on. And then, of course, we have Jerome's Robinson's diary. So uh, we know a lot about her. She died in 1898, and I, I always think it's a credit to her fellow soldiers that they buried her with full military honors. Another very well-known woman soldier during the war was an Irish immigrant woman named Jenny Hodgers, who served with an Illinois regiment under the alias Albert Cashier. She fought with the 95th Illinois from August of 1862 until the end of the war uh, and lived on into the 20th century. She chose after the war not to um, take on or not to revert to a female identity. And in fact, it appears that when she went into the military service, she had already for some time been masquerading as a boy, as a young man. And after the war, she continued to live as a man in Illinois uh, until 1911, when she was run over by a car, and it broke her leg. And it happened. She had to go to the hospital. And in the hospital, her sex was discovered for the first time, at least the first time that we know. It seems like many of these women soldiers probably had some allies within the service who knew uh, their true identities and helped them cover. Certainly women soldiers wrote that they recognized other women soldiers in the service uh, in ways that men perhaps didn't recognize them. But in any case, we don't know that Cashier had been identified as Jenny uh, before uh, she broke her leg. But once she broke her leg, this is a very tragic story in my opinion, uh, under the assumption, I have to believe, that living your life as a man meant that you were crazy. She was taken from the veterans hospital and put in the insane asylum, the state insane asylum. And she spent the last three years of her life there uh, being required by the asylum staff to wear dresses, which she hadn't worn for virtually her entire life. And according to one nurse in the hospital, pinning her skirts together out of embarrassment uh, for having to wear skirts. One of the interesting, uh, and she died in 1914. Um, we know about Jenny Hodgers because she be began receiving a pension as Albert Cashier in the 1890s, and she received that pension steadily up until the time her identity was revealed in 1911. And then the pension office went into a frenzy <laughs> trying to figure out what they'd been doing, paying this woman a pension. And had she really been a soldier, or had she been collecting her brother's pension? Did she have a twin brother who would, whose name was Albert? So the pension file, again, very rich, very interesting uh, to read. The other interesting thing about uh, Jenny Hodgers is that um, she actually spent some time, several weeks, I believe, in a Civil War hospital, very sick with chronic diarrhea, a common uh, Civil War ailment, and apparently was never discovered during that period to be a woman. And I can only imagine what this says about the quality of medical care um, <laughs> during the Civil War. 
that she could be hospitalized for weeks and never be discovered. Maybe she was so ill, the assumption was that she would die anyway. Don't bother touching her. Don't go near. I don't know, but uh, she did recover and went on, as I said, to live into the 20th century. The other person I'll just briefly mention, because I'm watching my clock here, uh, is Sarah Rosetta Wakeman. Uh, this is the only woman soldier that I know of up to this point in time whose Civil War letters we actually have. And uh, uh, they have been published, and they're fascinating to read. Sarah Rosetta Wakeman was a young farm girl from New York, and she served in a New York infantry regiment. She actually died in the service uh, and was buried as a male soldier and was only discovered 100 years later to have been a woman when her letters were found in the attic of some of her family's descendants, her birth family's descendants. Her letters are very interesting because she tells us all about what she did, how it felt to her, what she liked about it, why she went off to war. Uh, and interestingly enough, although she, she, she writes to her family and tells them about being a soldier, and not she's not an army woman, she's not just doing laundry for the soldiers. She's serving on picket duty. Uh, she's on the firing line. Uh, but she writes about those things, but she signed her letter as Sarah Wakeman, uh, or Rosetta Wakeman sometimes. She, but, so she signed in her female identity, which suggests that there wasn't a lot of censorship going on in the Union Army uh, either, <clears throat> reading her letters and, and finding it. So that's an interesting story. How, how women were able to do this kind of work and stay undercover as long as they did in some cases uh, is a very interesting question, but I'll, I'll leave that uh, for now. and We can come back to it in the Q&A if you'd like, uh, also uh, about women spies and how they were able to accomplish what they accomplished. Let me just close my formal remarks by saying a couple things about the impact of the war. It, it would be wrong to uh, not to, to point out that if you had to pick a group of women in America for whom the war had the greatest impact of all, uh, it would be a mistake not to remember the slave women who became free people as a result of this war. And, you know, at least two million women went from being slaves to being free people. How much of an effect this had on the way they lived their lives uh, is, is harder to say because freedom for many of the former slave women looked a lot like slavery, actually, uh, for a very long time. But freedom was still better than slavery, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a freed woman who would say, no thanks, I'll take slavery, that was better. Uh, but it is an enormous transformation in terms of the meaning of their lives, their capacity to have some sense of um, personal, or to maintain a sense of personal dignity, to put their families together, uh, to have legal marriages, to hold on to their children, uh, and so on. So uh, for freed women, the war, of course, has enormous significance. For white slaveholding women, uh, as, a, as a group of women in society, in America, it is a, a total unmitigated disaster. Uh, now they have to find out where their kitchens are and how to cook and how to clean. And uh, it sounds, I know it sounds kind of funny, and it's very hard for me as, a, as someone who really is happy the union won the war. <laughs> Really happy the union. I mean, I'm unmitigatedly biased on that score. I really think it's good that slavery's dead, and I'm really glad the union won the war. And it's hard for me to be sympathetic towards white slaveholding women who couldn't seem to understand why their slaves left. You know what? We were so nice. We were such a happy family. And why did they leave when the war was over? Uh, now they really have to learn lots of new. Uh, skills that are very hard for them. They really resent it. They really resent it that patriarchy didn't serve them very well. Paternalism didn't serve them very well. Their men are sick and wounded. The economy has collapsed. Patriarchy is dead. The slaves are gone. Uh, it's, it's a terrible situation for them. Uh, and there's a lot of rage, much of which gets then channeled into the lost cause ideal and memorializing the heroism of white soldiers during the war. Um, but that's a it's, a, it's a very bleak picture for them. Also, of course, a very bleak picture for the 75% of white Southern women who didn't own slaves. Only 25% of white Southern women owned slaves uh, during uh, prior to the war. So 75% didn't own slaves, and for them, it's also a very bleak picture. A lot of wounded men, 
uh, or dead uh, husbands and brothers and sons and an economy in total disarray, and they have to find a way to come back from that. For northern women, for northern white women, the war uh, has a much different kind of uh, meaning. Certainly victory is a lot more fun than defeat, and they can look forward to, uh, although the collapse of the southern economy is grave for the nation as a whole, for the North, feels you know mostly like victory is very good. And for lots of these women I've talked about today who were engaged in war work and have seen it be, and have seen victory, in part as a result of their efforts. The time has come now to re-engage and, and engage more fervently than ever before in moving women's rights forward, engaging in uh, activities that will demonstrate to the state uh, the importance of women's involvement in, in national activities, the importance of women's equality. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that it's very soon after the Civil War is over that the women's rights movement, which had had a, a, a start prior to the war, gets relaunched in the North, largely led uh, by women who had been involved in Civil War work. And women's education also expands dramatically. And women's temperance activism on a national scale expands dramatically. And a lot of this, I think, has to do with women's involvement in the war and their sense that what they had done was very valuable and it contributed to victory. And there was, you know, the time was now to move forward. Uh, and I'll close with that and, and take any questions you may have. Thank you.